Pardon, Allah.
कृष्ण चंद्र प्रभु हरे कृष्ण यस प्रभु कैन यू प्लीज मेक विद्वान प्रभु द होस्ट आई मिस्टेकनली मेड यू द होस्ट ओके ओके हाउ डू आई गो गो टू द पार्टिसिपेंट प्रभु यस गो टू द पार्टिसिपेंट्स क्लिक ऑन विद्वान प्रभुस नेम एंड यू कैन सी मेक होस्ट एज एन ऑप्शन मेक होस्ट है डन प्रभु ओके थैंक यू सो मच So I, oh, I got to lost, but I stop and go for next. Somewhere in the middle of chapter two. Yeah, this I read. I read this. <clears throat> Uh, this also had a. Yes, this also had a doubt. Yes, this also we read. Okay, I'll start with twenty five. Ano bhagwate vasudevaya. The proper ki jai. The proper ano bhagwate ki jai. Proper tells short stories. Prabhupada wanted his devotee scientists to form the Bhaktivedanta Institute by writing books and giving lectures. They should destroy the theories that life comes from matter and that there is no supreme being. Notice these two things. They should destroy the theories that life comes from matter and that there is no supreme being. The atheistic scientists. will be very stubborn you want them to illustrate the stubbornness of the materialists robert told the story of scissors philosophy two men were arguing about which cutting instrument should be used a knife or scissors knife said one no scissors said the other their talk became a heated fight 
If you don't agree, said the man who advocated the knife, I'll throw you in the river. No, I'll never change my mind. It's scissors. So the knife advocate threw the other into the swift river. He swam for a while, but became exhausted and began to sink. But he was so stubborn about holding his point of view that even after he was sinking under the water to his death, he held up his arm, crossed his fingers back and forth like a pair of scissors cutting. The scientists will be like that, said Prabhupada. Even after defeating them with all logic, still they will say life comes from matter. But more sane and innocent people would be convinced by Vedic presentation that life comes from life. Sadhapada Prabhu once he mentioned that uh, this is a fact which is known even amongst the scientific circles. You have to let the old generation die with their ideas. And therefore, Sadhapada uh, Prabhu himself, he said that we should be focusing on students, young people with open minds, young, educated, intelligent persons with open minds, directly present Krishna consciousness. Let these old people die with their theories. It's very, very hard to change them. Prabhupada did not like his disciples to perform artificial austerities. When one devotee appeared bare-chested in the cold at a Kumbh Mela, Prabhupada reprimanded him. On another occasion in America, he teased his disciple Naranara, who came into the cold temple room wearing only a light t-shirt. Naranara said Prabhupada from the Vyasa you must be eating chickens. The other devotees turned and stared. Yes, said Prabhupada, this is how the Mohammedans keep warm. Are you eating chickens, Naranara? No, Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada then began telling a story of how the Mohammedans keep warm. The system is that a man tries to eat 100 chickens by eating a single chicken. A farmer will take 100 chickens and then feed one of them to the 99. He then feeds another one to the remaining 98 and another one to the remaining 97. Finally, when there are only two chickens left, he feeds one chicken to the other. Then that chicken is fed to the emperor. In that way, he is considered that he is eating 100 chickens. More short stories. In order to push his disciples to work harder, Prabhupada sometimes used sarcasm. He was tired of delays by the workers in executing a Mayapur residential building, and he blamed it on his devotees. When one of the leading managers among his disciples made an excuse, Prabhupada retorted by quoting a humorous verse, big, big monkey, big, big belly, silon jumping, melancholy. Everyone laughed at Prabhupada without at first catching the meaning. He explained that his managers were like the monkeys who unlike Hanuman, would not jump to Ceylon, Sri Lanka, said to be. Despite having big muscles and big bellies, when asked to do something heroic, they could not. One of Prabhupada's disciples had a chronic disease that the doctors couldn't diagnose, although the doctors said she was incurable. Prabhupada said that these doctors were like a group of men who formed a conspiracy against a man named Bhagavat. Bhagavat's friends wanted to play a trick on him. So 10 of them conspired. Then when Bhagavat went to visit one of his friends, the man gasped and cried, Oh, you've become a ghost. Bhagavat, in amused disbelief, replied, No, I haven't become a ghost. What's the matter with you? But the friend repeated in a horrified voice, You've become a ghost. Bhagavad didn't take it seriously. But when he saw his next friend, the man acted in the same frightened way. After this happened 10 times, Bhagavad himself became horrified. Yes, I've become a ghost. I've become a ghost. Prabhupada indicated that sometimes by conspiracy and maya, we think that we are sicker than we really are. The story is coming from Bhaktisiddhan Sarsi Prabhu. One time, while Prabhupada was eating jackfruit, he joked about the taste of jackfruit. A man in a foreign land tried to describe jackfruit to a friend. 
But he confessed that there was no way to describe it unless you tasted it. When the friend insisted on some verbal description, the man replied that if you <laughs> still drink sugarcane juice through a Muslim's beard, then you might understand the taste of the jackfruit. Prabhupada said that attempts to understand the rasa dance of Krishna by unrealized persons are like that. So just as this is ridiculous, the other attempt is also ridiculous. Prabhupada and the deity. Okay, this is uh, personal about Prabhupada and the deity. He was so kind to bring the accessible Krishna Murti. What did we know? How could we succeed? But he did it, starting with Lord Jagannath, then little Radha Krishna in New York City. Prabhupada crouched down before them, ordered simple service, kept them in his room, and explained to us that they are not idols. The deity is Krishna. He advised us, if you think of Swamiji and Lord Jagannath all day, then at night you will dream of them. Dancing before the forms of the deity, he taught us. Dance, okay. It must be dance. Dance before the forms of the deity, he taught us. Otherwise, no one could introduce the deity to the Westerners. Or else it's part of the previous sentence. He advised us, if you think of Swamiji and Lord Jagannath all the day, then at night you will dream of them, dancing before the forms of the deity, he taught us. Otherwise, no one could introduce the deity to the Westerners. Now that they are here in so many temples, future religious historians may think they came by another means or that any devotee could have called them, but Prabhupada was the one empowered to call the deity. In the beginning, he asked him to please take care of himself if the Mlecha turned devotees made offenses. But it was also Prabhupada who later saw that the worship was going on nicely and he approved that Krishna was being worshipped in grand style. Like the Brahman who called the deity to witness, Prabhupada asked the Lord and he agreed to come. Like the Brahman who called the deity to witness, this is the history of Sakshi Gopal. Prabhupada asked the Lord and he agreed to come. On Prabhupada's invitation, along with the sound of Kirtan, Krishna was received in simple settings, in converted rooms. Puja began for the Lord in rented houses in places such as Boston, St. Louis, Buffalo, and then in grand temples. Great acharyas of the past installed one deity, their beloved Radha Krishna, but Prabhupada worshipped dozens of Radha Krishnas, and he traveled to see them. He was the champion of Radha Krishna, installing and distributing Radha Krishna on every continent, again and again bathing, chanting, dressing, performing the installation. Prabhupada crouched before the Lord. And sometimes he cried joyful tears at the darshan of the glowing Radha Krishna. He noticed how they were being served and dressed, and he made a stern point that we should never change things whimsically after he had left. Of course, transcendental and matter of fact to Srila Prabhupada that we must worship the deity of Krishna. Of course, we must do it. Or how will we remain purified? And of course, he's Krishna with flute and three curved form with Radha beside him. And of course, we have to give them our devotion. It was a matter of devotional fact. He will come when there are devotees and they will worship him. Yet, is it not a great miracle? Prabhupada has brought Krishna. Krishna has agreed. And the ex mlechas have agreed to accept him. And they pray. O oh Lord of the universe, by Prabhupada's grace, kindly be visible unto me. Why are you asking so many stupid questions? Prabhupada was sitting on a straw mat on the sunny balcony of the Calcutta temple, about to receive a massage from his servant when a new disciple, Panchit Dravida Das, approached to ask him, approached to ask a few questions. Prabhupada, I used to be a musician, said Panchit Dravida. So could I be a musician again and just play music for Krishna? 
Yes, said Prabhupada, you can do that. Prabhupada spoke calmly, relaxing under the hands of his massaging servant. But then there will still be some karma you will have to accept. Well, maybe that's not what I should do then, said Panchit Dravid. But it's just that brahmachari life is a little difficult for me. In the life of a brahmachari, you have to live under very institutional conditions. A few other devotees had gathered around watching Prabhupada and listening to his words. The sound of birds and street noises filled the air. You can be a brahmachari and live outside the temple. Really? Panchatravida was surprised to hear such liberal concessions. But again, Kila Prabhupada qualified it. Yes, you can live outside, follow the four principles and be a brahmachari. But of course, if you did that, you wouldn't be part of our movement. Oh, Panchatravida sounded disappointed. Well, maybe Prabhupada, he continued, maybe I can get married. Yes, said Prabhupada in a leisurely, tolerant manner. You could do that if you like. Panchatravida decided to ask no more questions and he ex excused himself from Prabhupada's presence. Later, some of the senior devotees told Panchatravida that they had never heard Srila Prabhupada speak quite like that, sanctioning whatever his disciple had asked for. Panchatravida wasn't satisfied. The following day, he happened to be outside Prabhupada's room. Just as Srila Prabhupada was looping his brahmanical thread around his ear as he prepared to enter the bathroom. Seeing his spiritual master, Panchatravida spoke his mind again. Srila Prabhupada, you know, yesterday I asked you all those questions and you said I could do so many things, play music, live as a brahmachari outside the temple or get married. So I'm a little confused. I was wondering if I do these things, will I have your blessings? Prabhupada cast a penetrating glance into his disciples' eyes and replied, Why are you asking so many stupid questions? If you do not know what the spiritual master wants, how do you expect to have his blessings? Shila Prabhupada then walked away and entered his bathroom. Panchatravida was left with his first lesson of spiritual life. Do what the spiritual master wants. And he also better appreciated by the way Shila Prabhupada was dealing with him that Prabhupada was transcendental, not an ordinary being of this world. Actually, if one is not ready to carry out the instructions of the perfect, pure devotee of Krishna, then there's no point in accepting him as one's spiritual master. Prabhupada masterfully solving problems. A few months ago, after his questions to Prabhupada in Calcutta, Pantit Pravida approached him in Bombay and handed him a piece of paper saying, I wrote this song. All right, said Prabhupada. Just leave it here and I'll look at it later. Prabhupada thanked Srila Prabhupada and started to leave the room when suddenly Prabhupada spoke again. Here, let me see that. Prabhupada then looked at the words to Panchatravida's song and said, so can you sing it? Yes, Srila Prabhupada said Panchatravida, I have a guitar. Prabhupada then asked Panchatravita to get the guitar and sing along with Prabhupada and his servant. Prabhupada took the mridanga on his lap and his servant played kartals and Panchatravita began strumming chords to accompany his own singing of his original devotional song. 5,000 years ago on this very day, a small blue boy made his way into this dark and troubled land, into this dark and troubled world. The men rushed the men rushed by on their charging steeds, looking for the child who will one day kill the king, looking for the child who will one day kill the king. Nanda Maharaj, I can find 32 auspicious symptoms on the body of your son. I'm wondering how this child could have taken birth in the family of covered men. How this child could have taken his birth in the family of covered men. Robert smiled and enjoyed the song along with his Disciples, actually, before I forget, I must say, Prabhupada wanted the entire Krishna book to be converted into poetry um, so that uh, the entire content will become very popular amongst uh, the masses. 
in the poetry, in the songs, in the songs. That would be if, if uh, there are devotees with that kind of a talent, that would be very, very nice to be a great service to Prabhupada. Prabhupada smiled and enjoyed the song along with his disciples. Outside Prabhupada's room, one of the devotees told Panchadravida that he should consider this the perfection of his guitar playing career and that he could now forget about the guitar. Panchadravida held on to his guitar for another month or so, however, although it wasn't much appreciated by the other brahmacharis, then one day he decided to give it up. Although it was a $200 guitar, he accepted $5 for the guitar and case and sold it to another devotee musician. The same guitar then became part of further interaction with Srila Prabhupada in Mayabur. The new owner of the guitar, an American disciple, had been causing considerable trouble for the devotee community because of his violent temper. And almost all the devotees were apprehensive of his presence. Prabhupada heard different complaints and one day called the devotee before him. You sing so nicely, said Srila Prabhupada. Why don't you and your wife just travel all over the world singing to attract people to Krishna consciousness? Greatly encouraged, the devotee soon left Mayapur. On the authority of Srila Prabhupada, he walked off singing with his guitar. Although the Shastras say that no one can know the mind of the Acharya, and although Prabhupada never said that he had sent away a troublesome devotee by suggesting that he travel and sing, nevertheless, most of the devotees in Mayapur could not help but appreciate how Prabhupada was masterfully solving problems. This was Prabhupada's way of, in any case, Prabhupada's way of solving problems was um, to make an arrangement by which everybody progresses in Krishna consciousness. Krishna does not lament like that. It was Prabhupada's custom while visiting the ISKCON temple on Henry Street in Brooklyn to receive the ISKCON artists and review their latest paintings for his books. But when one of the veteran painters, Jadurani Devidasi, showed Prabhupada a recent picture of Krishna and Vindavan, she got an unusual response. The picture showed youthful Lord Krishna sitting in the bushes of Vrindavan. His head was tilted and with his hand to his forehead. Uh, to his forehead, he was in a dejected mood. Beyond the bushes, some of the gopis were searching for Krishna. What is this? asked Prabhupada. It was as if he did not know what to make of it. Is something wrong? asked Yadurani. This is Krishna lamenting because Radharani has left him. No, said Prabhupada. Yes, said Yadurani. It's right there in the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Krishna is lamenting because Radharani went off and so he went into the bushes and was lamenting. No, said Yadurani. Krishna is not like that. Yadurani insisted that it was in the book. But Prabhupada objected. Krishna does, does not lament like that, he said. Prabhupada did not say exactly what was wrong, but the devotees became distressed, especially the artist. Everyone felt uncomfortable until Srila Prabhupada found the solution. You can use this painting for another idea, he said. This can be the picture where Krishna has a headache. Prabhupada leaned back, satisfied and repeated. Yes, Krishna has a headache. Everyone sighed in relief as Prabhupada found another way to appreciate a devotee's service. If Krishna has a headache, it's a totally different pastime. Actually, all of you are good. On another visit to the Brooklyn temple, while Srila Prabhupada was seeing the latest paintings of his artist disciples, he suddenly asked that a tape be brought of his singing the bhajan, Jeev Jago. Within a few minutes, the tape was found and Prabhupada sat back silently listening along with the room full of devotees. He became so absorbed in listening to the singing that to the devotees it appeared he had entered a spiritual trance. Even when he looked up and glanced round the room, they felt that Prabhupada's spiritual mood was deep and unapproachable. When the tape was over, Prabhupada still could not speak, so it appeared that the meeting was over. The devotees began to reluctantly rise and leave, 
but one of them came forward with another painting. Prabhupada, we forgot to show you. Here's one more painting. Yes, Prabhupada. Yes, said Prabhupada, still in a very thoughtful mood. Yes, it is good. He then looked around at the assembled devotees in the room and began shaking his head appreciatively. Actually, all of you are good, he said. You're all good. And in your association, even I am good. Otherwise, I am very bad. Now the meeting was over, as no one was able to reply to Prabhupada's humble statement. All Uttama, Uttama Dikaris, they naturally tend to think like this. Little drops of nectar. Some of Prabhupada's disciples were in the midst of famous or infamous careers just before they joined him to take up full-time spiritual life. Jagatarani Devi Dasi had been a leading movie actress in Australia and had just made a film with Mick Jagger, Mike Jagger, before deciding to surrender to Srila Prabhupada. One day, one time, while Prabhupada was visiting in Australia, a reporter picked up on the story that the former actress had now become a renounced devotee. They ran two pictures in the newspaper showing Jagatarini first as a movie actress with makeup and fashionable attire, and then in a sari, washing a pot. When the newspaper came out, the devotees were amused and wanted to bring it to Prabhupada, although Jagatarini was frightened that he would be displeased. When Prabhupada saw the photos, he laughed. In this picture, as a movie actress, she looks morose and she's not very beautiful, said Prabhupada. Then he pointed to the picture of his disciple in a sari. But in this picture, she looks very lively, very beautiful. But to the materialist, he will see it the other way. That evening in the temple, when Jagatarini approached Prabhupada's classes and to receive a piece of prasadam, he said to her, you are very fortunate because Krishna saved you from all that nonsense. Jagatarini Mataji is, uh, made uh, a display of Vrindavan uh, in Australia. And visitors are, you know, it's open to visitors. They come and see. And India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he, uh, um, he spoke about it in his, one of his national addresses. And there were also videos showing that also. Good. Very good it is. Very good. A newly wed disciple once approached Srila Prabhupada for advice about marriage and got a puzzling reply. Srila Prabhupada had himself performed a fire yagya ceremony for the young man and woman in his London temple. And the next morning, the newlyweds managed to accompany Srila Prabhupada alone on his morning walk. The husband walked next to Prabhupada and the, walk, and the wife walked three paces behind. Prabhupada, what does it mean to be married in Krishna consciousness? Prabhupada was silent for a moment and then said, to be married in Krishna consciousness means that before you eat your prasadam, you go out in the street and you call three times loudly. Does anyone want to take prasadam? Does anyone want to take prasadam? Does anyone want to take prasadam? If no one comes, then you take your prasadam. The husband felt somewhat bewildered because he was hoping to hear direction about the position of a married couple and how they should deal intimately in relating with each other. The young man thought that perhaps Prabhupada had not understood him. So near the end of the walk, he again asked the same question. Prabhupada, what does it mean to be married in Krishna consciousness? Prabhupada steadily repeated his answer. To be married in Krishna consciousness means that before you take prasada, you go out into the street and you call loudly three times. Does anyone want to take prasada? If no one comes, then you take prasada. Charity is the primary duty of a householder. We should not be like this neophyte Krishna conscious grass and be puzzled by Prabhupada's advice for the householders. In his memoir, the devotee states that he thought Prabhupada didn't understand him. Prabhupada understood perfectly. He also gave advice for the bona fide behavior of the grass. 
there are full instructions for the grahastha given in the seventh canto of shrimad bhagavatam and these few words spoken by prabhupad are among the scriptural directions for household life we cannot say why shila prabhupad chose to give exactly these instructions and only these instructions first of all however the new householders should accept that prabhupad's instructions are shastri and secondly they should try to think why prabhupad has chosen to give these particular instructions he did not arbitrarily select from the many scriptural injunctions the particular instruction shila prabhupad gave that the householder should not just make an arrangement for his own sense gratification in eating but should share it with others first stresses that the grahast ashrama is a renounced way of life the young householder admitted that he wanted to hear from prabhupad about the intimate dealings of husband and wife but prabhupad pointed out that that is not what grahast life is about according to the varnashrama system the grahast is actually the material provider of the whole society a neophyte devotee may think that if he gets married he can make a better arrangement for an independent life of eating and being comfortable which he could not arrange so nicely as a brahmachari the particular instruction that prabhupada chose to give cuts this misconception to pieces rather than become a sense enjoyer once married the grahast is seen here as one who has to carry a burden for all human beings and even other living creatures this is a picture of a householder not making arrangements for enjoyment but getting up from his table and going out to provide for others before he takes his own meals whatever instruction shri prabhupada gave however odd or puzzling it may have seemed in context was certainly scriptural and if one thinks about it carefully he will see how the teaching applies perfectly to his own case when acted upon it will bring success in prabhupad nectar we see prabhupad giving particular instructions to particular person we may say that these instructions do not have to be universally applied but at least in every case they are absolute instructions it is a test of every sincere disciple whether he follow the instructions prabhupad gave them we have already cited this point in connection with prabhupad's warnings to the devotee artist who was developing sahaja symptoms reading anecdotes about shri prabhupada's practical instructions we can appreciate the particular instructions he gave different persons and we can imbibe the general instruction that one should always respect meditate on and carry out the instructions he or she received from the spiritual master now let me see if uh... just a minute right annam bahu kurvita it's a statement from shruti make a lot of food make a lot of grain and distribute it um this is some compilations actually from maya vadi made it but uh, the reason why i got it is um is filled with various quotes from various scriptures on the importance of distributing uh food and uh, there's a lot of uh, lot of scriptural quotes like here the daswan and the daswan and the daswan and yudhishthira this is um is this this is uh here yeah 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 give food give food give food thus spake shri krishna to yudhishthira while advising him on dana the discipline of giving in the bhavishya purana the bhavishya purana is probably recounting the conversation that takes place in the mahabharata between shri krishna and yudhishthira the culmination of dashamedha yagya undertaken by the latter after the victory in the war before the yagya yudhishthira along with his brothers and in the presence of shri krishna sits at the feet of bhishma lying on his bed of arrows and at his request the grand old man instructs the freshly anointed king of hastinapur on all aspects of dharma 
Bhishma's instructions run to about 25,000 verses, constituting almost a quarter of the epic Mahabharata and comprising two major parvans, two major cantos, the Shanti Parvan and Anushasana Parvan. These are cantos 12 and 13 of the Mahabharata. It is at the end of this great instruction that Bhishma leaves his mortal body and Krishna Dvaipayana Vyasa and Sri Krishna advised the grief-stricken Yudhishthya to undertake Ashwamedha, the yajna of the great kings. After performing the Ashwamedha and being relieved of the great effort and activity that such a yajna involves, Yudhishthya wants to be instructed by Sri Krishna himself on the intricacies of dharma. Sri Krishna's instructions run through another 1,300 verses constituting the Vaishnava Dharma Parvan in the southern reading of the Mahabharata. Towards the end of this grand discourse on Dharma, Yudhishthira asked Sri Krishna for the essence of the entire teaching of Bhishma. Bhishma Vakya Sarabhutam Vada Dharmam Sureshwara. O controller of the Devas, please tell me, Dharma, uh, tell me that Dharma which is the essence uh, of everything that was spoken by Bhishma, to which Sri Krishna replies, Annena Dharyate Sarvam. Jagadeta Characharam Annada Pranado Loke Pranada Sarvado Bhave Tasma Dandam Visheshena Datavyam Bhutimichata. The world, both animate and inanimate, is sustained by food. The giver of food is the giver of life and indeed of everything else. Therefore, one who is desirous of well being in this world and beyond should make special endeavor to give food. So, this is actually, um, this is how he begins. And he speaks 15 verses. The first 10 of these lay down the centrality of Annadana, the giving of food in the life of a householder. And the next five celebrate the greatness of food, Anna. We are talking of grain. Anna means grain. It's emergence out of the vital essences of earth and its intimate connection with all life. Most of the vast classical Indian literature on Anadana, some of which we shall have occasion to recall in the following, seems to be in the nature of an elaboration of these 15 verses. Uh, okay, anyway, let me read out. I'll read out only a translation. The translation of these statements are more or less okay. The world, both animate and inanimate, is sustained by food, actually by grains. Life arises from grains. This is observed all around and there can be no doubt about it. Therefore, one who wishes to attain well-being in this world and beyond should offer grains. Every time it says food, keep in mind it must talk about food grains. So I'll read it as food, but remember it is anna. Anna means grain. To all who seek. One should give food in accordance with time and place and should keep giving to the limits of one's capacity, even if prepared to cause inconvenience to one's family. Finding an old person, a child, a tired traveler, or a venerable one at the door, a householder should offer him worshipful hospitality with gladness in his heart, as he would to his own teacher. Desirous of well-being beyond this world, the householder should purge himself of all anger, all jealousy, and offer worshipful hospitality with grace and courtesy to the one who appears at the door. Never offer slight to a person appearing at your door. Never let a falsehood escape from your lips in his presence. And never ever ask him about his lineage or learning. The one who appears at the door at the proper time, even if he were an outcast, or such a one as partakes of the flesh of a dog, flesh of dog, deserves to be worshipped with the offering of food by him who seeks well-being beyond this world. O Yudhishthira, the one who shuts his door on all comers, and indulges in the enjoyment of food for himself alone is certainly ensuring that the doors of heaven shall be shut upon himself. And his virtue is indeed great, who propitiates, who worships, who honors. With food, the ancestors, the gods, the sages, the venerable ones, the destitute, and all those who appear at his door. The one who gives food to those who seek, and especially to the brahmana seekers, is rid of all sins, even if his sins were immense. The giver of food is the giver of life and indeed of everything else. Therefore, one who is desirous of well-being in this world and beyond should especially endeavor to give food. Like this, there are so many 
food is indeed the preserver of life and food is a source of recreation when there is no food the five elements constituting the body cease to be without food even a strong man loses all his strength therefore food whether taken in reverence or otherwise has a special place in life the sun through his rays draws out the vital essences and vayu the wind god gathers these and places them in the clouds the vital essences thus collected in the clouds are showered back on the earth by indra suffused with showers the goddess earth of bharata is verily in contentment out of the contented earth grow the food crops which sustain all life flesh fat bone and marrow are formed of these alone they are like this distribution of uh, uh, bhagavat prasad is foundational to the entire ashrama system which is fully dependent on the grihastha ashrama for this actually misused intelligence in australia prabhupada was talking to a room full of guests he spoke of misused intelligence he said that people in the human form of life have the opportunity for spiritual realization and yet they are simply misusing their intelligence shri prabhupada's talk was being recorded by several tape recorders and microphones were propped up on the desk before him the mood was serious just as in a formal lecture prabhupada was intent on his deliverance of krishna consciousness to the people in the midst of the talk a newly initiated brahmachari disciple was sent forward to give prabhupada a goblet of water the goblet was a fancy one with a small base and a large opening it had been placed upside down on the silver tray along with a pitcher of ice water the brahmachari nervously brought the tray on prabhupada's table while everyone watched him and waited not perceiving that the glass was upside down the boy somehow thought that the base was actually a funnel in which he should pour the water but as he started pouring the water splashed off the base of the goblet and onto the desk what is that said prabhupada it is water prabhupada said the brahmachari disciple by now several people in the audience rose to help the situation no one was laughing rather there was pained embarrassment that such a strange thing had happened in prabhupada's presence finally the boy sat down again and shri prabhupada recommenced his lecture misused intelligence said prabhupada and the audience laughed with him appreciating his wit and his ability to re- to relieve the awkward moment as soon as you say i want it is all sense gratification all nonsense one time while prabhupada was in mayapur a disciple of his came from africa with the intention of performing extreme austerities in the holy dham instead of living in the residential building the devotee stayed in a small hut near a field of banana trees reportedly he was chanting 120 rounds of japa a day sleeping 2 hours a day and only taking a small bit of prasad shila prabhupada knew of the boy's presence in the dham but at first he said nothing publicly then one morning while prabhupada was walking around the pond one of the devotees mentioned the latest austere practices of the devotee from africa some of the devotees had been impressed since they knew how difficult it was to chant so many rounds and to sleep and eat so little shila prabhupada said shila prabhupada said one of the devotees he is now increasing his chanting and is not associating with anyone so he won't engage in any idle talk yes said prabhupada non committal he wanted to live on the river shila prabhupada now he wants to live in a tree then prabhupada revealed his mind all nonsense he said and he waved his hand dismissing the whole endeavor as soon as you say i want it is all sense gratification all nonsense because such an attitude of sense gratification is the exact opposite of of uh, uh, the very process of chanting hari krishna haridas thakur he taught us the process we chant the holy names we are fully obedient to lord chaitanya mahaprabhu and 
In fact, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's representatives too. That is how we have to increase our chanting. Not like this. On one hand, we pray to uh, Radha Krishna, please engage me in your devotion service. On the other hand, we try to escape from devotion service. Doesn't, doesn't match. Little drops of nectar. In Mayapur, especially at the time of international festivals, different disciples would take the service to guard Srila Prabhupada's door. Their function was mostly to screen potential visitors so that Srila Prabhupada was not constantly interrupted. The guard would also go and fetch anything that Srila Prabhupada wanted. One time, while Mahabuddhi Das was guarding Prabhupada's door, Srila Prabhupada called him in and asked for the juice of a fresh dab, coconut water. But even while Prabhupada was talking, his sister Bhavatarini suddenly entered his room. Prabhupada's sister, known as Pishima, uh, or aunt, to Prabhupada's disciples, uh, had free entrance to see Prabhupada whenever she wanted. Besides, no one could really restrain her if she wanted to see Prabhupada or talk with him or to cook for him. As Pishima sat down in the room, Mahabuddhi got up to carry out Prabhupada's desire for the fresh dab. But Prabhupada spoke sternly, sit down. Mahabuddhi sat down again. Prabhupada spoke with the sister in Bengali for about 20 minutes while Mahabuddhi waited, chanting silently on his beads. The talk between Prabhupada and his sister was enthusiastic until towards the end when Prabhupada became somewhat reprimanding. Finally, Bhavatarani offered her respects to her exalted brother and left the room. Prabhupada stood up and Mahabuddhi started to leave to carry out his interrupted errand. As if to explain his action, Prabhupada quoted a verse. Matra svasra dhvitrava na viviktasano bhavet balavan indriya gramo vidvam samapi karshati. This is there in Bhagavatam. One should not allow oneself to sit on the same seat even with one's own mother, sister or daughter. For the senses are so strong that even though one is very advanced in knowledge, he may be attracted by sex. Learning the etiquette of how to deal with women does not free one from sexual attraction. As specifically mentioned herewith, such attraction is possible even with one's mother, sister or daughter. Generally, of course, one is not sexually attracted to his mother, sister or daughter. But if one allows himself to sit very close to such a woman, one may be attracted. This is a psychological fact. It may be said that one is liable to be attracted if he's not very advanced in civilized life. However, as specifically mentioned here, with Vamsamapitar Shakti, even if one is highly advanced materially or spiritually, he may be attracted by lusty desires. The object of attraction may even be one's mother, sister, or daughter. Therefore, one should be extremely careful in dealings with women. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was most strict in such dealings especially after he accepted the sannyas order. Indeed, no woman could come near him to offer him respect. Again, one is warned here with that one should be extremely careful in dealings with women. A brahmachari is forbidden even to see the wife of the spiritual master if she happens to be young. The wife of the spiritual master may sometimes take some service from the disciple of her husband as she would from a son. But if the wife of the spiritual master is young, a brahmachari is forbidden to render service to her. Of course, Prabhupada being a liberated soul does not um, have any lust and uh, greed and so on, the way conditioned souls uh, we have. But unless the leaders exhibit behavior that is beneficial for neophytes, uh, we will never learn. Yadhyata charati shreshta tatta deve tarojana. Spreading Krishna consciousness in India often meant that Prabhupada went with his disciples to honor Prasadam at people's homes. Thus eating became a form of service to Krishna. When Giriraj Das first arrived in India, he was used to strict training as a brahmachari and his personal habit was to be particularly reserved about accepting any sweets 
On one occasion, however, Prabhupada saw that his disciples' hostility was causing discomfort to their host. The father of the man who had invited Prabhupada to eat had repeatedly tried to give Giriraj a second rasgulla, but Giriraj kept refusing. Since Giriraj was sitting quite close to Prabhupada, he did not want Prabhupada to think that he was a sense enjoyer. So for that reason also, he staunchly refused to accept the rasgulla from the elderly father of the host. Finally, when the man came around again to coax Giriraj, Chila Prabhupada glanced lovingly at Giriraj and said, you can take a sweet to make an old man happy. Giriraj accepted another sweet. Prabhupada also described that his spiritual master was very strict in following the rule of not being alone with a woman. One time, one of Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati's disciples, uh, Dr. Kapoor, accompanied by his very young wife, was seeing Bhaktisiddhanta Sarsitvata, Dr. Obiel Kapoor. During the discussion, the young wife said to her husband's guru, I would like to ask you something in private. Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati replied, I cannot see you in private. Whatever it is, you can ask me here. Well, the Prabhupada commented that at the time, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, that at the time, uh, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, uh, at the time Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati said this, he was old enough to be the young girl's great grandfather. Yet he strictly applied this rule to set an example. Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati's great disciple, Srila Prabhupada, did the same. In general, children and neophytes uh, have a tendency to imitate and not to carry out the instructions. So therefore, um, genuine leaders uh, go through a lot of austerity, in fact, to behave in ways that are very conducive for us. Those who are beyond the three modes of material nature actually don't, seriously, strictly speaking, they don't have to follow um, meticulously the various regulations that are circumstantially imposed upon us. But uh, nevertheless, they know very well our mentality that if they don't follow, then we will use that as an excuse not to follow. Chila Prabhupada said, on health and sickness, regarding your physical malady, you should do whatever is required to treat it properly, whatever is most practical. First of all, there is no question of a devotee becoming ostracized because he has become ill. Nor do I think this is being widely practiced. Who has been ostracized? One of the symptoms of a devotee is that he is kind. So if our God brother becomes ill, it is our duty to help him get the proper medicine and treatment so that he can recover. Regarding Bhu Mata Devi Dasi's affliction, she should simply take the proper treatment. Make the best, you, best out of a bad bargain. This material body is a bad bargain because it is always miserable. So to make the best out of this bad bargain means to render devotional service in any circumstance. The dust from the lotus feet of the spiritual master is never to be used for material benefit. That is a great misconception. The best thing is that the girl tries her best to chant 16 rounds daily and to follow all the rules and regulations, even if she is afflicted with something. And in this way, she will fully understand the mercy of Krishna and the spiritual master. Doctors give medicine, medicines, medicine, and they speak surety, but there is no surety. And where there is no surety, why should we break our four basic principles? I don't think there is guarantee of surety by taking this medicine with animal products. But if there is surety, you can take. But it is very doubtful. There are many examples in history of persons who have been very much disabled physically, but who still have executed Krishna consciousness. Still, up to date, in places like Vrindavan, India, there are many persons who are blind, crippled, lame, deformed, etc. 
but they are determined to practice Krishna consciousness to their best ability. Simply be determined to practice the process of Bhakti Yoga with whatever abilities you have. If you are really sincere, then Krishna will give you help. If you require any medical help, you take as much as is needed. So you have done your duty at the last moments of your wife's life so that she could hear the chanting. As to where she has gone, that depends on what she was thinking of at the time of her passing away. That is stated in the Bhagavad Gita. And whoever at the time of death quits his body, remembering me alone, at once attains my nature. Of this, there is no doubt. To remember Krishna requires practice, and this is mostly to be done by chanting Hare Krishna mantra. Regarding the auto accident, just hold a condolence meeting for Raghavdas Brahmachari and pray for his soul to Krishna for giving him a good chance for advancement in Krishna consciousness. Certainly, Krishna will give him a good place to take birth where he can again begin in Krishna consciousness activities. That is sure. But we offer our condolences to a departed soul separated from the Vaishnavas. Do you know that there must be prasadam distributed? Three days after the demise of a Vaishnava, a function should be held for offering the departed soul and all others prasad. This is the system. Raghav Das Brahmachari, regarding him, you'll find some material. The diary of Ratnavali Devi Dasi. She is a disciple of Bhakti Charya Swami Maharaj. I have a remembrance of my last past life as a brahmachari named Raghav Das. And then a lot of discussions about it. In fact, he also quotes this saying. Prabhupada tells a story about Jester Gopal Bha. Prabhupada introduced his disciples to the stories of the Jester Gopal Bha, who was famous in Bengal for his intelligence, wit, and quick thinking in the court of Krishna Chandra. Prabhupada said that no one, not even an emperor, can always be serious without any relief. But since everyone had to treat their king very respectfully, there would be one person allowed to spoof with the king. The king would also be able to joke with him because if the king were to do that with his prime minister, the prime minister's prestige would be reduced. So King Krishna Chandra was always engaged in a battle of wits with his joker, Gopal. One time Gopal walked into the king's court and the king said, Gopal, you're an ass. My lord said Gopal, I'm not an ass. That's a difference between me and an ass. Gopal then measured out the distance between himself and the king and said, six feet. When Prabhupada laughingly told the story, his devotees were not only amused, but amazed that Prabhupada was inviting them to hear and laugh at the wit of Gopal Bha. Then Prabhupada told another story. Gopal was building a new house. And according to Vedic custom, before you open a house, you have to have a sacrifice called a Griha Praveshana. This means there is a Yajna so that the house is pure and offered to God. No one is allowed to pass any stool in the house or it will be considered contaminated. Nothing is used by anyone until the Brahmins enter with Sankirtan Yajna, reciting mantras and sprinkling Ganges water. Thus, in the Vedic culture, everything, including building a house and conceiving a child, is regulated so that at every point one is conscious of Krishna. 
But Prabhupada explained the king wanted to defeat Gopal. So he offered a large reward of gold coins if anyone could outsmart Gopal and pass tool in his newly constructed house. One day, Gopal was inspecting his house when a man sent by the king came up and pretended to be suffering from an urgent call of nature. Gopal, he said, I have to immediately pass tool. Please show me your bathroom. I cannot contain myself. All right, said Gopal, come on. He took him over to the bathroom of the newly constructed house and allowed the man to squat down inside. But when he tried to close the door for privacy, Gopal stood there by the open door. Gopal, why are you standing there and not allowing me to close the door? Why are you holding that big stick in your hand? Gopal said, well, you can pass tool in my bathroom. But if you pass one drop of urine, then I'm going to smash your head. Then the man laughed and confessed, you're very clever. And he ran off, defeated. Prabhupada laughed after this story also. Although the devotees were a little puzzled, Prabhupada admitted that the Vedic humor was somewhat subtle. He said that the humor was connected inseparably with the culture. And if one did not know the culture, he might not understand the humor. But in Vedic culture, religion, humor, art, music, everything was connected. The story wherein Gopal Mahan outwitted the man who tried to pass tool in Gopal's new, newly constructed house contains lessons that can be applied in higher matters. Prabhupada used it to illustrate a cheating mentality of people who, who appear to say one thing but then secretly make conditions to make their main statement impossible to carry out. It is very difficult to pass tool without passing at least a drop of urine. Gopal was giving the man permission with his speech but the proposal was almost impossible. Moreover, Gopal was ready to punish him if he failed to do the impossible. We should be careful that we ourselves do not become duplicitous in our dealings with others so that we ask of them things that are impossible to achieve. Also, a devotee preaching in the world of shrewd materialists should be careful not to be cheated by the luring proposals of businessmen, politicians, and other sense enjoyers. By clear intelligence, if we can penetrate through such devious word jugglery, we shall be able to assert pure Krishna consciousness and expose the cheating attempts of others. It is one thing to be amused when hearing how Gopal outsmarts the king and his friends, but it can also be a more serious matter when we are tested with difficult to solve life problems. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, we read how Bhima and Lord Krishna advised Arjuna to kill Ashwatthama, whereas Yudhishthir, Draupadi and others advised Arjuna to spare Ashwatthama. It was impossible to satisfy the desires of all these exalted persons. But by Krishna's grace, Arjuna was given a brilliant solution. There are similar cases of Vaishnavas being given difficult or seemingly impossible tests, yet they were able to solve the contradiction. When a Vaishnava by his Krishna conscious intelligence eludes the traps of the materialists or defeats them with superior Krishna conscious logic, it is more than mere amusement. It is a wonderful victory. More about Gopal. One day, the king's wife gave birth to a male child and the king was rejoicing. At that moment, Gopal came into the room and the king said, Gopal, on this very, very happy occasion, please tell me, what do you have to say? Tell me exactly how you feel at this moment. Gopal replied, frankly, at this moment, I feel very happy after passing stool. Gopal, how could you say such a thing? The king was mortified. On this auspicious moment, that's all you have to say? I'm completely disgusted. It's not funny. And I don't appreciate your humor at all. After that, the relations between the king and Gopal were strained for some time. One day, Gopal was rowing the king down the river when the king suddenly had an urgent call of nature. Gopal said, on this side, there is a very heavy jungle area. It's not very suitable. Let's go a little further down and we'll find a better place. The king said, go over to the side. Gopal said, not here. There is danger. Some thieves and decoits. Your life may be in danger. There's a place ahead. The king said, Gopal, I cannot wait any longer. Immediately go over. Gopal had to go over and the king jumped out. He could hardly contain himself. When the king returned, Gopal asked him, how are you feeling? The king replied, I'm feeling very happy after passing stool. 
Then Gopal said, don't you remember? This is exactly the situation I was in after your child was born. When you asked me at that moment what exactly I was feeling, I was in the same situation as you are now. I told you how I was feeling. But you thought I was insulting your son and you never appreciated me. Now do you understand? So these are all coming from my Guru Maharaj. Personal. His regular schedule. This is something to be noted. Prabhupada was very self-disciplined and very organized. Prabhupada followed his own schedule and only occasionally departed from it. He was supposed to take massage at about 11 or 11.30 in the morning. But if he had guests and was preaching, he would not stop for the schedule. Or at night, he would keep talking, especially with some life member or solicitor in Bombay. But he was never whimsical about time or about where to be for Krishna's service. Once after walking along, along Juhu Beach for half an hour, Dr. Patel, one of his friends who joined us to walk, suggested that we turn back. Prabhupada looked at his watch and said that it was too early. The deity of Radha Ras Bihari would not give darshan for another hour. Dr. Patel said, if you come back early, since you are a pure devotee, Krishna can give darshan early. Prabhupada said, that was out of, out of the question. We cannot change the deity's schedule to suit our own. He never went off alone without devotees accompanying him. It was unheard of that he would say, I'm leaving for a few days, or I'm going on some private business, or I'm going on a vacation. There are no holidays in Krishna consciousness. In fact, my Guru Maharaj, Rajai Patak Maharaj, he often says during Prabhupada's time, we were all trained like that. There's no question of a holiday in Krishna consciousness. Um, in places like Mayapur, which is a full-fledged Krishna consciousness uh, township, uh, it is still uh, the opinion of uh, uh, persons like my Guru Maharaj who are personally trained by Prabhupada, that actually Sunday should not be a holiday. What is this holiday? Seven days a week? Every day is meant to be a holy day. No holiday. There's no question of vacation and all these things. Uh, he did say that we can maximum have a change. On Sundays, devotees can do some others, some other set of um, activity which comes under the realm of devotion service. They can maybe go to some dweep, they can do some kirtan, um, they can go on do book distribution. Um, in the 90s, when I was uh, one of his uh, secretaries in his office in Chakra building, he said, Saturday, Sundays, uh, maybe you can do youth preaching, like that something. Maybe that can be a change of that nature, but no holiday. And he said, this is how Prabhupada trained this. So Prabhupada trained this. And that's coming straight from Prabhupada himself. Everything was done at the right Krishna conscious moment. Even his solitude. One could overhear it. As he produced the Bhagavatam or when he was chanting Hare Krishna Mantra on beads. The silence of his pure consciousness, we could not try to understand. But there were glimpses of it when he would sometimes tell us of a dream he had. Or he would reveal something he had been thinking of alone. In New York City, in 1968, after staying up very late at night, Prabhupada rose and traveled early in the morning to Boston. He then rode back to his temple president in the New York City who had not been able to rise on the morning of Prabhupada's departure to Boston. Don't just praise me, Prabhupada wrote, but do as I do. Prabhupada followed his schedule with considerable strictness. Events would crash down on him. News of a demon's attack might make him grave. Yet, he would go off gravely to his bath or take prasadam, unless it became too much. Unless it became too much means like, for instance, uh, When the influence of uh, Sahajiya uh, ideology entered into his con, and when um, our devotees 
started to started to read out and meditate on the conjugal pastimes of Lord Krishna and the gopis, things like that. Those kind of things were reported to him, immediately stop eating and immediately call for a meeting and immediately smashed it, stopped it. That is extreme danger, extreme danger. Uh, so that is an instance of uh, unless it became too much. Then out of anxiety, he would not attend to his eating. Once he stayed up all night worrying when a leading disciple showed signs of serious deviancy. One time when shown colored photos of the first Ratyatra in Los Angeles, he stared in transcendental pleasure for hours and did not take his massage. Promptness was the steady factor punctuated by these departures, which showed us something beyond the schedule. Usually, however, everything was taken care of, absorbed into his routine. He did not fit the stereotype of an Indian who was always two hours late for every meeting. India is very infamous for this, outrageously late. Robert regularly glanced at his watch. And sometimes when his servants were not ready to leave, he would walk out of his room and head for a waiting car, prepared to leave them behind. Yet he did not appear like a karmi, bound hand and foot to following an imposed schedule that gave him no freedom. The Bhagavad Gita describes the regulative, regulated principles of freedom. Prabhupada was liberated, but both to show us and to live in the most effective way to accomplish his service, he organized the 24 hours of the day and night. There was a best time when the air was cool and the neighborhood quiet for taking a morning walk. There was a best time to greet the deities according to their time. There was a best time for devotees to gather, a suitable time to eat for health and a reasonable time to answer letters, to regulate his men so they would rise early, heroes early. He preached to his guests at times convenient for their schedules. Thus he scheduled his transcendental acts, not for the rules sake, but for performing constant optimum service to Krishna, for spreading and solidifying his ISKCON movement in this world. Prabhupada wants me to paint. One of Prabhupada's artist disciples, Maradaraj Dhans, had his own ideas of how he should preach until Prabhupada impressed him with his own desire and definition of preaching. At the time of receiving his Gayatri Mantra, Radharaj asked Prabhupada, may I ask, may I ask you a question? Prabhupada nodded and Radharaj pursued it. I would like to go and preach. He was about to speak further, but Prabhupada cut him off. What do you know about preaching? Prabhupada challenged. His disciple became speechless. Preaching means to describe Krishna, said Prabhupada. So you're doing it by your painting. Prabhupada leaned forward across the table and looked into Bharadaraj's eyes. Please try to understand, said Prabhupada. If you don't do this important service, who will do it? Go on painting. Bharadaraj left the room, contemplating what Prabhupada had said. He thought how he had wanted to tell Prabhupada, I want to go to Russia. Maybe if he had said this, said that, it would have made a difference. But then Prabhupada's own words reverberated in his mind. And finally, he began to understand it. He began to realize that just knowing another language was no great qualification for preaching. But by painting a picture of Krishna's name, fame, and pastimes, he could preach, a, preach anywhere and very straightforwardly in the universal language that requires no translation. The more he thought about it, the happier he began to follow Prabhupada's order. The next day, uh, Prabhupada again met with the ISKCON artists. Bharat Raj was eager to show Prabhupada that he had understood his teachings. Prabhupada was explaining the meaning of sannyas, which he said was to preach by serving Krishna with body, mind and words. Service with the mind, said Prabhupada, means the intelligence, the artist's special task was to serve Krishna with their intelligence. They should serve with their intelligence and not become diverted by many things. Thinking that he had finally understood the point clearly, Bharadaraj spoke up. Prabhupada, he said, the other day you said preaching is to describe Krishna. Yes, 
said Srila Prabhupada. One should offer the words to Krishna through speaking. Mahatma Raj became bewildered again. And his former desire to preach by traveling and speaking words and not painting came to his mind. He thought he had understood Prabhupada, but now as Prabhupada enlarged his explanation, Bharat Raj wondered. The artist can also preach in the temple to the devotees, Prabhupada said. But mostly he continued to stress that the artists sit and paint as their best preacher. Seeing Bharat Raj's confusion, Prabhupada turned to him. So Bharat Raj, where do you want to go? Bharat Raj felt himself falling into a trap, but he could not resist it. Russia, he said. Prabhupada moved his head back in surprise. Russia, he said. And he laughed. On that note, Prabhupada ended his conversation with the artists. I have now been a fool twice in front of Prabhupada, thought Bharat Raj. And he resolved never to again bring up his restlessness in front of Prabhupada. When will I learn? He thought. Prabhupada wants me to paint. Craftsmanship. So Prabhupada said that one had to first become acquainted with Krishna in order to love him. As the representative of Krishna, Prabhupada attached his devotees to himself and then he attached them to Krishna's service. So it is stated in the Vedic Shastra that the infinite personality of Godhead reveals himself to the tiny spirit soul through the agency of the spiritual master. So Prabhupada attracted devotees through his books, through his lectures, through the Mahamantra, and by many other direct methods of bhakti yoga. He also developed individual relationships with his disciples, sometimes based on seemingly ordinary matters. Of course, the main relationship he had with each disciple was through their regular service. But sometimes he would exchange with them over little things. If he had met a devotee's parents, he might regularly ask the devotee about the well-being of his mother and father, or he would accept the gift of a daily mango or a twig for brushing his teeth, or he would call on a particular devotee to become an antagonist in mock debates. With Prabhupada's disciple, Chandana Acharya Das, Kila Prabhupada developed an ongoing acquaintance based on their mutual dealings over an Omega watch. When Chandana Acharya was given Harinam initiation by Srila Prabhupada in Boston, he gave Srila Prabhupada an Omega watch as a gesture of Guru Dakshina. You do not need this watch, Ashila Prabhupada. Well, you have given something very dear to you, to me. So I am giving the most dear thing I have. The watch had been given to Chandan by his father and Chandan considered it his most treasured possession. Prabhupada was pleased by the gift and explained to Chandan that giving and accepting gifts was one of the six kinds of loving exchanges in Krishna consciousness. The watch then became the basis of a series of conversations that took place over a year between Srila Prabhupada and his new disciple. Since the watch was running a little slowly, Chandan asked Prabhupada if he could first have it adjusted and cleaned before giving it to Prabhupada. Prabhupada agreed, but was disturbed to hear later that Chandan Acharya, Chandan Acharya had left the watch at the jewelers without asking for a receipt. Months later, when, Pra when Srila Prabhupada was in New Vrindavan, Chandan traveled along with hundreds of others to see his spiritual master. And Srila Prabhupada received him affectionately. Prabhupada was wearing the Omega watch. And on seeing Chandan, he said, This is a very nice watch. Do you have a watch? Prabhupada instructed his servant to give his old watch to Chandan Acharya. Prabhupada said that he had replaced the original Omega wrist band with a spring type metal wrist band because it is much easier to take on and off. Chandan was pleased to receive the old wrist band from Prabhupada which now smelled sweetly of sandalwood oil from being worn on Prabhupada's body. He put his old band onto a new expensive watch that Prabhupada gave him. As they sat together in Prabhupada's small room above the new Vrindavan temple room, Prabhupada admired his Omega watch. The only difference with this watch, said Prabhupada, is that it does not tell me the day or the date. That old watch did. Prabhupada, I can get you a little calendar, said Chandra, which will fit on the wristband. And that can be changed every month. Prabhupada said that would be good. And in the following weeks, there were further exchanges as Chandan mailed Prabhupada the risk calendars and Prabhupada wrote back thanking him. Months later, they met again in New York and talked more about watches. 
How's your watch? Asked Prabhupada. It's good, you know, Prabhupada. How's yours? It's slow, said Prabhupada. Why are they cheating like this? This is such an expensive watch. And you took it to be fixed. And it is slow, a minute or two every day. This watch, said Chandan, raising his wrist and showing the watch he had been given by Prabhupada. He said, fast, about five minutes every day. Well, at least it has a good qualification, said Prabhupada. That is fast. Chandan and the other devotees present laughed with Prabhupada about the cheating defects of the watches. Kirtananda Maharaj was also present and brought Prabhupada the plate of prasadam. Prabhupada took a single bite and then distributed the rest to everyone. So Prabhupada said, Kirtananda Maharaj, I just tried to make the sandesh the way you told me, but it never comes out the way you make it. I did everything you showed me. Prabhupada turned his head to the side and said, craftsmanship. Thus, in as many different ways as there were different disciples. Prabhupada exchanged with them and brought them into a loving bondage with Krishna, even while talking of watches and cooking. And that cannot simply be imitated because that involves craftsmanship. Little drops of nectar. When in January 1974, devotees saw Kohutex comet and told Srila Prabhupada. He told the comet a bad omen. In our childhood, he said, we saw a comet and the first world war was declared. The witnesses of the Kohutex comet told Prabhupada that it had filled up the sky near their airplane with flashes of light. And they say the tail is 3 million miles long. It's going very fast, so it is emitting a tail of gases. So who is supplying the gases, asked Prabhupada, the Arabians? He said the comet was like a policeman who all of a sudden comes before us. By his presence, we can understand that some criminal is present and the policeman is searching. He said disasters would follow. The anti-cult crusade in America, in America, not America, was only beginning its campaign during Srila Prabhupada's very last years. But Prabhupada gave good advice how the devotees could combat it and how they could realize they were protected by Krishna. Rameshwar was once explaining to Srila Prabhupada about these activities during a visit with Prabhupada in India. We are actually getting much free exposure on the radio and television, said Rameshwar Swami. And each time we come off sounding very intelligent, religious and nice and the deep programmers come off sounding like fanatics and by gods. So people are getting a good impression of us because of the publicity on radio and television. Yes, said Prabhupada, just like Sita was put into the fire and she came out unburned. Sita was blasphemed. They said this woman was kidnapped by Ravan and Ramachandra is so henpecked that he has again picked her up and is living with her. So Ramachandra put her in the fire and she came out Unharmed. So like that. When we pass through the test of our sincerity, we will also come out unharmed. More little drops of nectar. Prabhupada was talking with an Indian guest. Well wishing. The topic turned to the publication of Back to Garden magazine in various languages. Prabhupada is saying that the Indians would gladly read an English magazine. But Prabhupada's guests said that it would be much more popular if they could publish in Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi, and Bengali. That is not possible, said Prabhupada. That is for you Indians to do. But you have, no, you have not time. You are busy with your daughter's marriage and you simply advise. I am busy, replied the man with surprise. Yes, everyone, said Prabhupada. Every Indian is busy with his own affairs. He'll come and advise, that's all. Advice greatest. Free advice. But he will not do himself. The man protested. No, but. But Prabhupada knew better. No, this is going on, he said. I've got full experience that Indians, they will come and give some advice and go away for daughter's marriage. That's all. Well, the man tried to hold his ground. There are various types of Indians, you know. 
that time said proper this 99% you'll advise but you'll never do it this is going on a number of times uh, this point came up in uk i think in london in one of the conversation it comes one of the conversations it comes somebody is asking why are you paying attention to these foreign boys and girls and then drop out says because they do what i say and if i have to tell you something you will immediately come back with so many scriptural quotations and if i tell you to help you will say no but i have family obligations i have to do this i have to do mera dharm karna hai ye karna hai wo karna hai i have this obligation that obligation so many things are but these boys and girls i tell them to do something they do it that's all i tell them to chant hare krishna hare naam hai kevalo they they just they don't argue back they just do just do what proper says but um, in, in india proper always found it difficult because they would not do even in bombay um, it comes in giraj maharaj's book on the juhu story um that also it comes papa they saying this indian he will he will keep wearing his pant and shirt he will not put on this uh, uh, dhoti kurta like my disciple from america he will not do that and the lady is not going to wear this kind of uh, dress uh, now papa's time the his lady disciples were wearing sarees so they will not do these things they will not leave everything and just join the temple and you know whether you are a brahmachari grahastha vana prasa sanyasi whatever it is you just surrender no that much of faith in krishna they don't have so proper notice that but they will come and say hundreds of things but you should do like this you should do like that actually this is the best way to spread uh, krishna consciousness like there so many things they will say that's why he say you will advise but you will never do it this is going on on different occasions prabhupada explained how the british empire had done great damage to india's culture once he explained the home bill which had ordered india's gold to london even the mohammedans made their expenditures within india but the british took away india's gold then he described how the british sent indian laborers all over the world first of all it was conquered by indian soldiers said prabhupada then when it is then it was to be then when it was to be organized indian coolies indian laborers because they have got indian men and money so they expanded the empire so i am doing the same business american money and american men proper laugh to think of it i am already a great politician home bill with one of the devotees yes said proper but i am not for home i am for the whole world proper said on a balanced temple program in a letter of june 12 1974 to shri govinda das in chicago shri proper stressed book distribution and stated that other programs should be minimized after this letter had been distributed to various temples several devotees wrote to proper asking whether they should actually cut back on other existing programs like deity worship and other kinds of outside preaching Prabhupada's reply is stress the absolute nature of any Krishna consciousness service. The thing is that we should have a little common sense in all activities. The example can be given that women by nature do not forget to dress very nicely, although always engaged in household affairs. Deity worship or lecturing in the colleges is just as important as book distribution. So these things must be done very nicely, and at the same time. book distribution should be done so without giving up the existing programs this has to be added on not that we should do one thing at the sacrifice of another that requires a little common sense factually we should be engaged 24 hours in krishna service and everything should be done very nicely and perfectly regarding your question about the controversial talks going on this kind of talk is not befitting my advanced students this is childish in krishna service there is no inferior and superior deity worship is just as important as book distribution it is not material you should understand the importance of each and every item of devotional service do not make any misunderstanding by devaluating any of the spiritual activities 
one who distinguishes a particular type of service as inferior or superior. He does not know the value of devotion service. It is all transcendental. Whatever item is suitable, that is accepted as very elevated. Just like Maharaj Pariksha, he simply listened to Shukadeva Goswami. That is Shravanam. So any devotee executing any one of the nine items is transcendentally glorious. One devotee may be proud that his process of service is best. That is not inglorious. Everyone should feel proud of his particular type of devotion service. But that does not mean that other types of service are inferior. Everyone should feel proud of becoming a sincere servant of Krishna. But the pure devotee never minimizes the importance of other devotees. Krishna is an enjoyer of varieties of service. It is not stuck up with any particular type of service. On instructions from the outside institutions. Regarding the books from other muts being circulated there, who is distributing? Who is sending these books? These muts do not sell our books. Why should we sell their books? Who has introduced these books? Let me know. These books should not at all be circulated in our society. You say that you would read only one book if that was all that I had written. So you teach others to do like that. You have very good determination. I understand that in the past, you are visiting L and that you may also be planning to continue to visit him when you return to India. This is not approved by me and I request you not to, not to go see him anymore. He holds a grudge against my Guru Maharaj and even if it is transcendental, it will gradually appear mundane in your eyes. Whatever is to be learned of the teachings of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur can be learned from our books. There is no need whatsoever for any outside instructions. Notice how Prabhupada kept his movement quite isolated uh, in a certain sense. That is actually required. Uh, Bhakti Yoga is actually meant to be performed uh, without unduly subjecting ourselves to external influences. It's a standard principle actually. Unless we sufficiently pay attention to the various items of devotion service. Uh, it is not possible to, to progress in Bhakti Yoga. Okay, so I'll make a note. Uh, let me make a note before I forget. Not okay. Any questions? Just give me a minute, one minute, one minute. Vishnu Vandana Mataji. Harikshna Prabhuji Dandatana. Uh, you can hear me, Prabhuji? Yes, I can hear. Uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, wonderful class, Prabhuji. Uh, so many sharings from Prabhupada's past times. Um, just one. Uh, I mean, like a clarification because uh, uh, about the one of the devotee, you know, who has been uh, doing uh, these sincere, uh, who did the you know sincere austerity of you know like uh, doing um, hundred plus rounds, and Prabhupada mentioned it's nonsense, right, Prabhuji? So regarding that leela, right, like um, um, what should be the actual actual mood? Uh, in fact, like because uh, the mood is to be that we have to chant because to please Guru Maharaj and uh, to please Guru and Radha Krishna. Is that the mood? Uh, if that is the mood, then that is also there is a want, right, Prabhuji? So I can you please correct like is our understanding like what should be actually the mood of? See, the process of chanting Hare Krishna involves increasing the quality and quantity of chanting. 
but it cannot be done whimsically mm. there is a method on how it should be done our first business is to ensure that we are continuously krishna conscious um we need to come to that point now bhakti yoga according to rupa goswami can be executed in two different modes uh, one can carry out several different activities of devotion service or one can focus on a particular item only ekanga ashraya bhakti yoga ashraya two different types so generally we notice uh, bhakti yoga thakur then later bhakti siddhanta sulsi thakur and prabhupa they give us bahu anga ashraya bhakti there's so many different varieties because we are very restless we need to engage in various types of uh, devotional services in such a manner that we come to the point of uninterruptedly engaged in one or another type of devotional service that is the first point that is the first point now for that you need to carry out the instructions of the perfect pure devotee who specifically somebody like prabhupada who has proven that he could take people from tamoguna and bring them to a astonishing high degree of consciousness uh, in a complete satvik lifestyle you know prabhupada during prabhupada's time uh, iskon was primarily non congregational this that by itself is a great as a cause for great astonishment so he has proven is proven here i am having a method by which i am bringing people to such a high degree of vairagya vidya bhakti so just shut up and listen to him prabhupada also the same prabhupada has also written there is a book called namamrita as well and recently there was a compilation made called chanting hari krishna completely from prabhupada which makes it clear that over time we are meant to increase our chanting that is there but certain things cannot be whimsically done and that to uh, chanting the holy names uh, also has to be done with uh, great attention otherwise it becomes an offense and in fact bhakti vinod thakur says that is the root cause of all offenses and chanting the holy name has to be executed with a, a certain um, service attitude sevon mukhe hi jikhwado swayam eva spurtya da it is not a mechanical process that uh, you know with with no service attitude i try to capture krishna you know there's no way i can i can force it, force my way uh, towards prema bhakti that it doesn't work like that it doesn't work like that uh, so it has to be seen uh, in light of uh, rupa goswami's own teaching we have to be careful about Uh, the process what is the point if uh, one does not uh, remove the weeds you know when if, if you remember that example is there chaitanya mahaprabhu has compared the process of making spiritual uh, spiritual advancement to growing a creeper um, bhakti is compared to a creeper and uh, the process of shravanam kirtanam is compared to pouring water onto that creeper but if you are not attentive then various upashakhas or weeds may grow on top of the creeper and they will take advantage of that water they will grow they will prevent the creeper from growing so now these weeds represent the various anarthas the anarthas will increase instead of decreasing instead of anartha nivritti or reduction or cessation of anarthas you will have anartha pravritti you will have an increase of anarthas and where is that coming from that is coming from uh, this increase of shravanam and kirtana it is coming from that very same water that very same water which is supposed to help the creeper grow is now helping the weeds grow so by my increasing my chanting of the same hari krishna maha and i am not careful enough to cut those weeds out i am harming myself so therefore uh, the liberated acharya like prabhupad immediately can see can see that and therefore he is not just discouraging he speaks very disparagingly he is trying to warn uh, us that there is a process there is a process 
these are things actually which are which krishna himself makes us understand bhagavat vidhi and the intricacies of bhagavat vidhi needs to be understood by experience actually this confidential in that particular sense that it is an open secret against it uh, no matter how many times an unqualified person is told about it he'll never get it and not be able to understand it so therefore we are told sevon mukhe hi jipado swayam me vas puratyana so we chant hari krishna we engage in other types of activities in order to develop an attitude of service to krishna and krishna's devotees therefore bhakta siddhanta sachi tagore repeatedly spoke about hari guru vaishnava seva we have to keep ourselves busy in the 64 items of devotion service he often said uh, so when that happens then we will also develop an attraction for chanting the hari krishna mantra prabhupada also when he was asked about uh, how do we sincerely chant the holy name at that time uh, prabhupada explained that when you uh, that good chanting means after 16 rounds you think i should be chanting 16000 rounds every day and you try for that now that is a healthy increase in chanting that is healthy that is proper that is natural to become attracted to more and more chanting that is attra- that is nice that is not artificial that is not artificial this is where us uh, here with the incident that we came across in proper nectar in today's session that is artificial and the spiritual master's primary duty is to deal with attitude uh, because if the attitude is rectified then the execution of krishna consciousness the pre- prescriptions and prohibitions of krishna consciousness they will lead to spiritual fructification so prabhupada has dealt with uh, this particular uh, individual in this particular scenario like this but there are several other instances where um, he is pointing out that uh, the yoga dharma is chanting and we are supposed to chant so we are meant to chant constantly and so so it is you know we need to uh, we need to increase our quality and quantity of our chant it's not just mechanically saying that okay i am chanting let's say 75 rounds okay after chanting 75 rounds and my lust anger greed if it has increased then what is the you know what is that what is that what is that it is like prabhupada said elsewhere he is explaining a verse bhaktih paresha anubhavo viraktaram yatracha 11th canto uh, when one progresses in krishna consciousness his attraction for devotional service is renunciation and detachment and his knowledge and understanding enlightenment of krishna consciousness all of this will awaken and there is a standard example that's given that when you eat then your hunger diminishes so like that one's attraction towards sense objects will diminish um and then prabhupada says but suppose you go on eating 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 and after eating you become more hungry than before that means you never ate food you ate some rubbish mm. so like that Uh, when we do, when we after chanting hari krishna we our material desires are increased it means that we are, we are doing something terribly wrong something very very wrong because it involves a whole process and prabhupad also gave the example he said uh, it's like cooking is a process and if you say cooking involves taking a pot having rice uh, and having fire you cannot just keep fire in one place a pot some 10 uh, feet above and then rice somewhere else it's not going to this is not how you cook that's a process how you cook in a particular way how you cook you have to put the pot in water then you have to um, keep it in, in on top of the fire it's a process so same way it is not just uh, chanting hare krishna it's not just that there are 10 offenses to be avoided and uh, we need to chant knowing the meaning of the mantra we need mm-hmm. of course the mantra by itself is, has its own power but if you want to attain the perfection of uh, sadhana siddhi within one lifetime then there's a whole process if you want to make uh, if you want to come to the perfection over several lifetimes that's a different thing but bhakti siddhana sarasika and uh, prabhupada 
they basically take on an attitude that is any particular combination of activities and attitude uh, attitudes don't lead you to the highest perfection of krishna consciousness within one lifetime they condemn it even if it's fully authentic even if it's fully authentic they condemn it they criticize it. they don't forbid it. they don't say it's forbidden but they criticize it they they give the impression that no what is it useless like that and that is what has led to such a powerful boost in the preaching endeavors it is very astonishing uh, because of this particular policy so uh, that is another you now if you want to understand these things uh, clearly it is our duty to uh, go through prabhupada's books to understand the various nuances of krishna consciousness in fact prabhupada lilamrita and various um, not just prabhupada lilamrita even prabhupada's letters his lectures uh, and the kind of raw recordings you not know, direct recordings uh, you will be able to relish them the more you read prabhupada's books the more you carry out the instructions that prabhupada gives in his books in the association of prabhupada's followers um, then the more you will be able to understand it you know you'll have a better understanding of it also hmm. yeah thank you prabhu ji thank you for so much very very broad explanation this really inspiring thank you bankim hari krishna hari krishna prabhu naranjan yes. prabhu prabhu uh, i have a very basic question um, can you hear me prabhu yes i can hear you okay this is a very basic question prabhu See, you you talked about service attitude and uh, we have been hearing this that every devotee should have this service attitude now my question is what this service attitude why why should we develop this service attitude what should it this service service attitude finally inculcate in us what 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 it should result in us by having the service attitude what should we develop the reason why i am asking this is the devotee is we undertake many service and finally we are attached to the service or the position or the particular service you are doing so is it really helping us so if you can just uh, let me know prabhu first of all we should keep in mind that when rupa goswami talks about service sevon mukhe hi jikwado and so on he is talking about all of the different bhakti angas a bhakti anga refers to an item of devotion service there are 64 items of devotion service and that is what chila rupa goswami refers to as service within his cons managerial circles when we say service we don't actually we use a different language or we use a different terminology if you want we refer to i tell you to do something and you report back to me and that's what is called service the service that rupa goswami is talking about is the 64 items of devotion service now there may be a, a you know it will be it, most of the time there is in fact an overlap between these two but we should be aware of that that it is when we carry out the instructions of the scriptures coming through the perfect parampara that is what is accepted by lord krishna and happiness and that is what is called service it is that which is pleasing and it is in fact the service attitude which is pleasing it is which means the desire to make krishna happy the desire to improve in krishna consciousness and become fully fit to please krishna that is what is required it is not enough just to do an activity which is said to be pleasing to krishna if we don't progress in krishna consciousness if i don't progress in krishna consciousness then uh, it is like saying that i am taking this medicine that medicine there are so many things but ultimately people will say but have have you become healthy if if i have not become healthy and i simply keep saying no but you know i am very devoted to my doctor and i love my doctor so much 
and you know all these medicines are so colorful so beautiful so nice so tasty it's all fine but what is the result halena parichiyate the tree is known by its fruits apart from that ಭಗವತ್ಪ್ರಸಾದಿ but what is that bhagavat prasada and what is that nagati kutoki you should think about that that bhagavat prasada what does it actually mean that you know ultimately it is to make krishna happy fine it is to receive krishna's mercy but what is the symptom of having received krishna's mercy how do i know somebody is a recipient of krishna's mercy uh, to a far greater extent than myself so for that we have to come back to this it is vairagya vidya and bhakti these are the standard verifiable parameters by which we understand or another thing is we can examine the nine external verifiable symptoms of bhava bhakti when now of course one who has come to the platform of bhava bhakti exhibits all of these symptoms all the time now when we are engaged in sadhana bhakti also we will experience one or more of these nine at various points in time due to varied reasons uh, my i might especially have been in a very humble tolerant uh, respectful attitude today morning and i might have done some uh, services to the deities or the dham or my spiritual master or the vaishnavas or shrimad bhagavatam or chanted nicely and especially for a two hour gap a uh, two hour window you know was really experiencing certain types of uh, uh, internal peace uh, which cannot be explained in any material manner so we know that but in bhav bhakti it is that all the time one of the nine symptoms all the time so we understand that uh, i must have done it with the right attitude so that is what is referred to as a right attitude now uh, we have to take it all together we have to take it all together like for instance uh, i am engaged in some particular service to uh, the vaishnava community today some responsibility has been given to me if i have uh, the same goal um that uh, uh, liberated acharyas like prabhupada bhakti siddhanta saraswati bhakti you know then all have then i will simply want to ensure that this activity leads to its prescribed goal to the best you know to the highest standard now if somebody else comes who certainly and i know for sure can certainly do it much better than myself then i will happily give it over to him and i would just choose to either assist him or take up some other services which will be required and in lord chaitanya's mission the number of services keep coming almost uh, ad infinitum you know there's no scarcity of uh, devotion service in chaitanya mahaprabhu's mission so everything has to be taken together because i may like a particular service to krishna let us say i like to cook for krishna and i am let us say talented in cooking for krishna but i cannot afford to uh, disrespect um uh, certain other uh, devotees or even not devotees that will because our goal is not to become expert in just this one particular activity or that particular activity it is rather holistically seeing we want to make krishna happy which involves taking into consideration various aspects of vaishnava etiquette of uh, our preaching mission and so on so everything has to be seen in the name of uh, culturing a service attitude if i disrupt the entire uh, thing and i don't see the big picture i'm just obsessed with the small picture then superior vaishnavas will accept me as a person who is yet to mature in spiritual life they will not disregard because i do have some attraction to some service that comes under 
uh, devotional service. But you know, as we grow further and further in Krishna consciousness, then we begin to see the bigger picture. I remember many years back, um, I was my the Mayapur Institute had just started, and I was a teacher. I was a teacher from the first actually. I was like somehow somehow. I was thrown into it right from the beginning. And after a few years, when I joined in as a full-time teacher, that my authority, he told me, Vidwan, you should consider this is the greatest service. This is the greatest service to uh, Prabhupada. This is the service that pleases Prabhupada the most. And I immediately said, no, that's not true. The service that is most pleasing to Prabhupada is book distribution. And I know that. I know it very well. And he said, no, 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 you should not think like that. If you, if you think like that, you will uh, become lax in your service. I said, no, I will not become lax in my service. But I know that book distribution is the service that pleased Prabhupada the most. There's no doubt about it. There's no controversy about it. Even though all the different services are absolute. But the one that especially pleased Prabhupada was this, because this was particularly the service that Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasit Mahapur had given Prabhupada in Radha Kund, out of all places. If you get money, print books. Prabhupada even remembered the exact words his Guru Maharaj used. So that was dear most to his heart. So I said that. And he said, but most devotees, they cannot handle that. They need to imagine that the service that they're doing is the best. I said, that's all some tamasic stuff. What is this? Thing? How can I be put myself in tamoguna in an imagination? Imagination is part of tamoguna. How can I disconnect myself with reality in order to do that which is required. It's gone as a large machinery. And, uh, you know, we are, our different services are different parts of the cogwheels of, of different parts of that machinery. We should understand that. Not that I think that I'm the greatest and, you know, without me, the Krishna consciousness moment will collapse. Nothing like that. We are not at, not, not, none of us are indispensable. We die and go, the movement will probably become much better, actually. You know? don't have to be in a delusion like this as if we are upholding what is this you know we are not even proper sadhakas and we still have uh, plenty of uh, embarrassing anarthas and uh, most of us have a very colorful history of blunders and uh, you know we're not really you know we should just be ourselves and just be it's an opportunity it is an opportunity uh, this is the greatest opportunity that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has extended to us through Prabhupada's followers, that even in today's tamasic world and times, we are given opportunity to directly serve Krishna. Because all of this, when you serve Krishna through transparent via media, it is direct. It is direct. Just like uh, um, Sanjay says that he saw the universal form. By Vyasadeva's mercy, he directly saw. Very important it is. So we are all getting an opportunity to directly serve Krishna under the Guru Parampara that continues from Prabhupada. And we should all be indebted. We should be respectful. And not in the name of service attitude, uh, disrespect Prabhupada's followers and his family, create disruptions, create camps. Uh, we are supposed to push things forward, not take things backward. So these things take time and uh, it is our duty to help each other grow in this regard. Prem goes Sundar Prabhu. After this, I need to go. 5.30, I am supposed to be somewhere. Banki Prabhu, I'm sorry. Thank, thank you. Prabhu. Thank you. Prabhu. Prabhu. Yes, I have a question. I don't know whether I should ask this, but to my small intelligence, maybe I have not understood some one point correctly which you mentioned. That's why I'm asking this question. You mentioned that while we are trying to increase our chanting, etc., and we are doing the various processes, we will find the weeds growing. So my doubt or question about this is, uh, like when we try to analyze why these weeds are growing, uh, there could be possibly various factors or reasons. So how do I go about finding out? Is it due to my improper attitude? Is it due to my inattentiveness? Is it due to imbalance in types of devotional service? Or is it that I'm not making Krishna happy? I'm a little confused about this. How, how do we go about analyzing that? What is the actual cause? 
for the weeds to grow. In Madhurya Kadambini, Krishna Chakrati Thakur, he says that when one does not progress in Krishna consciousness, it, it is understood that he is committing Nama Parad. And one should not argue that he is not, because if he is not committing Nama Parad, he would have made spiritual progress. And there are verifiable symptoms of, uh, of a person, uh, a person's spiritual progress. So that itself is a proof that. Hmm, that uh, we are committing offenses, most probably unconsciously. So that's also another reason why we need to associate with the Sajati Ashe Snigdhe Sado Sangaswatakware. We need to associate with more advanced devotees who are affectionate to us. Um, and who are spiritually like-minded. Otherwise, we would not be able to successfully self-diagnose our own challenges. Actually, very important. I feel the major cause could be the, the offenses, the holy name or whatever, why the weeds are growing. Is that so? Yeah, of course. But if we don't uh, receive help from uh, you know, those who are substantially, vastly more advanced than us in Krishna consciousness, it's very difficult to progress. And when we become ready for it, then Krishna will certainly arrange that kind of association also. Of course, sometimes by the mercy of one spiritual master or uh, similar exalted devotees, one may get an opportunity like that also. Possible. All right, we should stop now. I have something else to do now. Thank you, sir. Thank you.